In modern society, energy is basically a necessity, but we probably rarely think about it. For millennia, humanity has tried to harness energy. In more recent times, we've focused on energy efficiency and environmental sustainability. But what if I told you that one man claimed to solve the energy problem? That's Stanley Meyer. He claimed to invent a fuel cell that could power a car on water, and he made some pretty bold claims about it. And we have calculated that if we take the dune buggy from Los Angeles to New York, we would roughly use 22 gallons of water. I'm not exaggerating when I say this technology would change humanity forever. And Meyer claimed to have turned down millions of dollars from Big Oil to sell his invention. He also claims he was threatened because of his work. Then, in 1998, at the age of 57, he died suddenly and unexpectedly while having dinner with some mysterious foreign investors. His last words were, they poisoned me. On today's project, we look at the life of Stanley Meyer, including his water fuel cell and all the attention that came with it, both good and bad. Then we'll look at the unusual circumstances surrounding his death. Did Stanley Meyer's invention cost him his life? Let's see what the evidence says. My name is Face, and welcome to Project Conspiracy. Stanley Meyer and his twin brother Stephen were born in 1940 and were very close. Stephen was quoted as saying, We were always building something. We went out and created our toys. Stanley grew up around Columbus, Ohio, where he finished high school. After that, he joined the military and had a brief stint at Ohio State University. Meyer said his background included working on heart monitors, validator systems for banking, oceanography, and the EBED concept for the Star Wars program. Meyer was also a religious man, and he was very open about his Christianity. He was also said to be a little, well, eccentric. Friends said his favorite phrase was praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Wanna... They say he once called the police to his home to report a suspicious package. The bomb squad detonated the package, only to discover it was equipment that Meyer had actually ordered. And for a period in the 1970s, Meyer lived with Charles and Valerie Hughes, who were truck drivers in Jackson Township, Ohio. According to the Hughes' daughter, Julia, Meyer showed up to their house one day and said, The Lord sent me here to this home. I'd like to use your home as an experiment. Meyer then spent the next few years there in the late 1970s. Remember how Meyer was always building something? He tried to pay them back by building a solar silo to heat and cool the home. It didn't work. But that solar silo wasn't the only thing that Meyer was working on around this time. In 1973, Saudi Arabia implemented an oil embargo against the United States. This caused the oil prices in the United States to skyrocket, and it also showed how dependent and vulnerable the United States was to foreign oil. As a result, Meyer started looking at water as a fuel source. Meyer wanted to use the energy and water as a power source to help reduce the United States' dependence on foreign oil, and Charles Hughes said that Meyer had some early success with it. He would see Meyer power his tractor for 15 minutes on well water, and he put his nose up to the exhaust. There was no fumes whatsoever. It was just clean, hot air. Meyer's end goal was to use water to power vehicles. To do this, he invented a water fuel cell to power the vehicle, and he continued working on its development through the 1980s and 90s. So how did this thing work? First off, let me be clear. Let me be clear. This episode is not meant to be a technical investigation of the engineering mechanics of the water fuel cell or car. But in layman's terms, the water fuel cell allegedly split water into its component parts hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen gas was then burned to produce energy, a process that reconstituted the water molecules. One source said that water electrolysis, which I understand was part of Meyer's process, requires the passage of electrical current measured in amps. However, Meyer's fuel cell allegedly achieved the same effect in milliamps. In other words, he claimed to be able to break the oxygen-hydrogen bond using much less energy than anticipated. Based on Meyer's claims, he basically made a perpetual motion machine, and physics says that perpetual motion machines are not possible at least known physics. But they say Meyer's design broke two laws of thermodynamics. We'll discuss that more in a minute, but it's a big no-no in the science world. That didn't stop Meyer from working, though. He even prepared a technical brief called The Birth of New Technology that goes into detail about his design. This thing's over 200 pages and includes numerous demonstrative figures. If you'd like to geek out on math and science, go check this thing out and let me know if it makes any sense. I don't speak mathematics. And Meyer was also granted patents for his design. Speaking of patents, there are a lot of 
claims online about Stanley Myers patents. Some sources claim that he owned a plethora of patents ranging from banking, oceanography, and cardiac monitoring, and that he had more than 200,000 patents to his name. No, I didn't misspeak. 200,000 patents. Can you imagine? Well, unsurprisingly, I couldn't come close to verifying this claim. In his technical brief we just discussed, Meyer himself claimed to have 26 patents. I found 28 of his patents on Google's online patent search. Most, if not all of them, look to be related to the water fuel cell and associated systems. I've also seen claims that Meyer had to actually go to the patent office and prove that his water fuel cell design worked. My understanding is that an invention submitted to the patent office has to be operable. But the patent office generally presumes that an invention works as claimed and won't make you prove anything. That said, if it appears to the patent office that an invention isn't operable or it violates the laws of physics on paper, then they might make you prove that the invention works. In fact, on their website, the patent office specifically notes that an application rejection can include the more specific grounds of inoperativeness, such as inventions involving perpetual motion. Since Meyer's claim design was said to violate known physics, that might be why he had to go do some explaining. Meyer also claimed to have constructed a functional model of the water fuel cell that he designed to work with a 1.6 liter Volkswagen combustion engine he installed in his iconic red dune buggy. In order to convert the conventional engine to work with a water fuel cell, he had to create numerous new parts and technology, thus the 25 plus patents he ultimately filed. So how did this thing work? They say he replaced the spark plugs with injectors that sprayed water as a mist in a resonant cavity where it was subjected to high voltage electrical pulses. This converted the water into a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen that was combusted in the cylinders and drove the pistons. And since the hydrogen was used as energy, the only possible emissions were oxygen or water residue. So what you're really seeing with the water fuel cell as it is today is that we have a full system engineering approach allowing us now to use water as a main fuel source to be able to run a conventional engine and run it on water and do it and equal or supersede the performance uh, of a, a car running on gasoline and diesel fuel. Many people uh, do not realize that when you run a car or truck on uh, either gasoline or diesel fuel, you're actually running an, on hydrogen. And all we're doing is using the hydrogen from water. And under the National Bureau of Standards figures shows that when you use water, the energy release is roughly two and a half times more powerful than that of gasoline. So water is a very powerful fuel. And all you needed to do was solve the answers of, number one, producing the hydrogen economically, controlling it on demand, being able to adjust the burn rate of hydrogen and gas to co-equal the fossil fuels. And the third one was to be able to transport it without spark ignition. And we've solved all of these problems on the design engineering. And, of course, the water fuel injector, as I've shown you, now gives us the abilities to uh, transport the water directly to the fuel injector, which is now going into the voltage zones, which now is performing the, the electrical polarization process that goes and triggers the hydrogen fracturing technology, but it's doing it inside the engine. So we all know that natural water um, is very stable, and therefore it, it becomes a very fail-safe operable system, as we pointed out earlier. And people took notice of Meyer's work. One source claimed that Meyer and his patented water fuel cell technology and systems had been under a national security review since the beginning of the crisis in the Middle East. The Pentagon flew a lieutenant colonel in last week to look at Meyer's invention. There is talk of possibly using it in the Star Wars defense program and to run army tanks. He had numerous speaking engagements in the 1980s and 90s, and he received several who's who awards or acknowledgments. He also claimed he received offers to buy his work. Big offers. Remember Charles and Valerie Hughes, who Myers lived with in the 1970s? According to the Columbus Dispatch, their son, Charlie Hughes, who's grown now, told a story about some strange men that came to his home in the late 1970s. Charlie was playing outside when the driveway suddenly filled with limousines. Men in turbans stepped out and asked for Meyer in what Charlie described as stern, thick accents. Charlie said, I remember because I was not allowed in my own house that day. The men left and Charlie was about to go inside, but then military vehicles filled his driveway with army brass there to find out what the foreigners wanted. At dinner that night, Meyer told the family, The Arabs wanted to offer me $250 million to stop today. You and this lovely family can live in peace and prosperity the rest of your days. According to his twin brother Stephen, Stanley got another offer in the 1980s. Stephen said, He turned to me and said, They just offered me $800 million. Should I take it? I said, Hell yes. How much money do you want? He got very quiet. When he got into that thinking process, I just let him alone. 
Meyer's work was also featured in a 1995 documentary called It Runs on Water that aired on BBC. But we also need to talk about the controversy surrounding Meyer's work. As I mentioned, the main issue was that his design violated two laws of thermodynamics. Specifically, Meyer's claims broke the first law of thermodynamics, which states when energy passes in or out of a system, the system's internal energy changes in accordance with the law of conservation of energy. In other words, energy can neither be created nor destroyed only converted from one form of energy to another. Meyer's work was also said to break the second law of thermodynamics, which states that the sum of the entropy, or unavailability of energy to be used for mechanical work, of the interactive thermodynamic systems never decreases. In other words, no process is 100% efficient. Some energy is always lost as heat. These two laws basically prohibit perpetual motion machines. And it's not me claiming Meyer's work violated these laws. It's respected scientists. And they say these principles rebut Meyer's claims. Wai Ching, a professor of mechanical engineering and director of the Sloan Automotive Lab at MIT, stated it simply and succinctly. A water molecule is very stable. The energy needed to separate the atoms is greater than what you get back. This process actually soaks up energy instead of giving it out. And Stanley Meyer agreed with at least part of that. So we all know that natural water um, is very stable. But Meyer insisted that his fuel cell could overcome this using a resonant effect. The secret, he said, was to resonate electricity at a very high voltage through water to fracture the hydrogen-oxygen molecular bond. The scientists don't buy it. Also, the designs he produced for his patent applications were criticized because they looked awfully similar to a normal electrolysis machine. Electrolysis has been around since the 1700s. It's cool, but not groundbreaking. And it still wasn't clear how Meyer's work bridged the gap from electrolysis to hydrogen fuel conversion. But like most things in modern society, Meyer's invention eventually made it to the courtroom. In 1993, three investors, including Richard Schneider, filed suit against Meyer in the Franklin County, Ohio Court of Common Pleas. Now, I found exactly one reference to this case in online articles, and it didn't say much. But I was able to get the actual court records for this case, which is useful. Sort of. From what I can tell from the allegations in the complaint and other documents, here's what happened. Schneider and the other two investors had a water fuel cell dealership contract with Meyer and paid him $40,000 for the exclusive right to use the technology in civil aviation. On August 18, 1992, Meyer sent them a fax canceling that agreement. Actually, Meyer's fax says that Rick Schneider, and only Rick Schneider, is to have nothing to do with the water fuel cell anymore and has 10 days to give all the equipment back to Meyer. The lawsuit also accused Meyer of fraud because the representations he made about the technology weren't true. Meyer initially had an attorney, but his attorney withdrew from this case pretty early on. After that, Meyer submitted his own filings. With all due respect to Mr. Meyer, his filings are a little tough to follow. But in a wild turn of events, it sounds like Meyer claimed that Rick Schneider pulled a gun on him and threatened to kill him at the airport on August 14, 1992. Meyer said the sheriff came out to investigate. A few days later, on August 18th, Meyer sent the fax canceling the agreement with Schneider. That would explain why Meyer wanted to then cancel the agreement. But it looks like this case was later voluntarily dismissed by the inventors, and it's not clear why from the court filings. The source I found that mentioned this case was the Columbus Dispatch, and they interviewed William Brooks, who was one of the inventors who filed suit in this case. He said that he was a sucker for some of this stuff at the time, and he invested more than $300,000 in Meyer's technology to eventually use in his aviation business. Brooks said his money was returned in a 1994 settlement, which appears to relate to this case. One question this raises for me is, if what Brooks says is true, where did Meyer get the money to pay for this settlement? Did he use money from other investors, or did he have his own money? And if he had his own money like that, why was he so dependent on investors? In any event, Meyer's legal troubles weren't over there. Around the same time in 1993, Two others filed suit against Meyer in Fayette County, Ohio. In this case, they actually conducted discovery to get evidence, and the inventors ultimately got a judgment against Meyer. So I wasn't able to get the records for this one, but there was a lot more information online about it, including a 1996 article by Tony Edwards in the London's Sunday Times. Apparently, things got interesting in this case when the investors' expert witnesses wanted to take a look at the car. One of those experts was Michael Lawton, Emeritus Professor of Electrical Engineering at Queen Mary University of London. But Lawton never got to inspect the car. Lawton said, Although Meyer had known about our visit weeks in advance, when we arrived, he made some lame excuse about why the car wasn't working, 
so it was impossible to evaluate it. Though apparently this wasn't Meyer's first run-in with Michael Lawton. Meyer's work was featured in the January 1991 issue of Electronics World, and that article said he had previously demonstrated the fuel cell for Michael Lawton and two other scientists. I'm not sure what to think of this, other than either Lawton wasn't convinced or didn't think that Meyer could get the thing working in a car. However, the one thing that Meyer built that appeared to work was his water fuel cell, so it was used as evidence in the case. They determined that there was nothing special about the water fuel cell and it was just using conventional electrolysis. And conventional electrolysis will not do what Meyer claimed. Meyer was found to have committed gross and egregious fraud and was ordered to pay the investors back their $25,000. So I think we can say the court probably didn't like Meyer's technology. But if you're liking this episode, make sure to hit the like button. It's one of the easiest and most effective ways to support a YouTube channel. Back to the case, Meyer's lawyer was Roger Hurley a retired Dark County judge. Later, Hurley said he still believed in Meyer. I would not represent someone who I would consider to be a shyster or a bum. He was a nice guy. After his legal battles, Meyer would continue with his work. But on March 21, 1998, that would come to a sudden and tragic end. On that day, Stanley, his twin brother Stephen, and two foreign investors were eating at Cracker Barrel. The group made an opening toast with cranberry juice and Meyer took a sip. Almost immediately, Meyer grabbed his neck, got up from the table, ran outside, dropped to his knees, and vomited violently. His brother Stephen quickly followed him outside. I ran outside and asked him, what's wrong? He said, they poisoned me. That was his dying declaration. Meyer then passed away, and many say that the dream of the water-powered car went with him. But this story isn't over. Not even close. So this is where conspiracy theorists go to work. They say Meyer's death wasn't an accident, and they have a list of suspects. Car manufacturers, big oil, the government, or maybe even an angry investor. They say they poisoned Meyer, just like he said. And skeptics can laugh at these theories all they want. But assassinations have occurred throughout human history, and all of the alleged suspects may have motive for Meyer to be unalive. Meyer's story as told online seems to mix fact and fable. But when it came to his passing, I wanted to make sure that I had reliable information. So I actually got a copy of his autopsy, coroner's report, and toxicology report. And let me say I'm not a medical doctor and I'm not making any medical claims here. I'm just a curious guy with internet access and a YouTube channel. But the autopsy and coroner report determined that Meyer suffered a rupture of cerebral aneurysm with subarachnoid hemorrhage and the unfortunate effects that follow that. Meyer did have a history of high blood pressure, which increases the likelihood of an aneurysm. I found one source that said Meyer recently got a clean bill of health from his doctor, especially in regards to his blood pressure and heart. But in full disclosure, I didn't find the source's veracity to be particularly compelling. And even if that were true, it wouldn't necessarily preclude Meyer from having an aneurysm. What about when Meyer ran outside and started vomiting? Well, it turns out that nausea and vomiting are symptoms of a ruptured aneurysm. But is it possible that he still could have been poisoned? Maybe poison caused the aneurysm. Well, his toxicology report showed trace amounts of lidocaine and diphenhydramine. My understanding is that lidocaine is sometimes used during CPR, which probably took place when the first responders arrived on the scene. And diphenhydramine is an antihistamine that relieves allergy symptoms. Also present on the toxicology report were therapeutic levels of phenytoin. Phenytoin is a drug that's used to control seizures. I looked into this, but I'll be honest. I couldn't determine why this might be in his system. Maybe he was taking a medication with this drug in it, but I don't have any indication of that. I also don't have any indication that this drug contributed to his death or caused the aneurysm. There's already enough misinformation about Meyer out there, and I don't want to add to it with baseless speculation here. So if you have any information or a theory about this, let me know down in the comments or in our Discord. Links in the description. All that said, at least one source said there is no known poison that can be used to induce a cerebral aneurysm. But some conspiracy theorists note that such a poison could exist outside the knowledge of the general public, and there are poisons that can't be detected by toxicology tests. That's probably true, but I can't prove that it happened in this specific case. But what about the foreign men that Meyer was having lunch with? Who were they? And did they have any reason to want to hurt the inventor? The coroner's report says that Meyer was having lunch with NATO officials at Cracker Barrel. I have no idea where the NATO reference comes from, and I couldn't find any other evidence of NATO personnel being on the scene when Meyer passed away. I suspect this is a coroner documentation error, but it looks like the two foreign men eating lunch with Stanley Meyer and his brother were two Belgian men, who I'm going to refer to as Philippe and Mark. Some people suspected that it was the two Belgians who carried out a hit on Meyer. So what were the Belgians doing there in the first place? According to the Columbus Dispatch, the men had agreed to purchase 56 acres along Seeds Road in Grove City, Ohio. 
The city had approved a research campus there two months before Meyer's death. The dispatch tried to contact the Belgians, but was unsuccessful. However, one individual online claimed that he emailed Philippe and got a response in July 2020. And let me be clear, I have no way of verifying that this email actually happened or that it was actually Philippe on the other end. But it's part of the Stanley Meyer lore at this point, and it looks like at least some of the claims in the email can be verified. According to this source, Philippe said the following. I met Stan at the beginning of 1995 and found his project interesting for its possible contribution to mankind. We became friends and I supported him financially until his death. I had bought the land in Grove City for him. He wanted to have a place to build a research center. The intention was to officially inaugurate this on Saturday the 21st of March 1998. Because of this, I organized a weekend visit as often. Arrival Friday 20 and departure Sunday 22. I had taken Mark with me, at Stan's request, to improve our communication via computers. Mark had nothing to do with the project. Rabbit hole warning. So is there any truth to Philippe's story? Well, I went and checked out the Grove City Council meeting minutes for the months leading up to Meyer's death to see if there were any Seeds Road properties on the agenda. Believe it or not, there was. The January 20, 1998 minutes show a request to rezone a tract of land on Seeds Road south of Enterprise Parkway and to approve a development plan for a water fuel cell development center there. The council did approve it, so this part of Philippe's story appears to add up. And the police didn't have any information to implicate the Belgians in any foul play, though there might be some issues with that. The police performed a three-month investigation of this incident, and what I'm about to tell you comes from the Columbus Dispatch. The Grove City Police taped interviews of more than a dozen witnesses, but they didn't have audio tapes of the two Belgians. Lieutenant Steve Robinette said it's possible the two men's interviews were not taped, though it would certainly seem strange to record some interviews, but not to record the interviews of the men he was eating with when he claimed to be poisoned. But in the July 2020 email, Philippe denied any involvement in Meyer's death, and he even seemed surprised that someone would implicate him. I have some doubts about whether his death happened by chance, but I know nothing more than anyone else. What is certain is that I didn't kill him. He was my friend, and I even paid his bills the week before. Why someone made a fake video about me and my friend as Stan's killer remains a mystery to me. Maybe someone who wanted to draw the attention away from himself? However, Stanley's brother Steven said the Belgians' reaction to his brother's death was unusual. I told them that Stan had died and they never said a word. Absolutely nothing, no condolences, no questions. I never, ever had a trust of those two men ever again. Philippe recalled that event differently. The next Saturday, his brother told me that he had died. His death was a great shock, especially the loss of a friend and also a valuable project. The next day, Sunday, I flew back with the booked flight. There was nothing more I could do. I only knew Stan, and his brother took care of everything. There was no evidence of foul play to go off of, so the police adopted the coroner's conclusion that he died due to an aneurysm. But as you can see, there are still some unanswered questions around Meyer's death. But we've also got the issues of the water fuel cell technology and the car. What's going on with that? Well, that 1995 documentary called It Runs on Water speculated that Meyer and other inventors may have tapped into zero-point energy. Within zero-point energy is the idea that at absolute zero, the amount of energy is not zero. But there is still some energy left that is called zero-point energy. This has been described as a sort of jitter of atomic particles because they cannot sit totally still. In other words, zero-point energy is the lowest possible energy that a system can have. But the problem is that Meyer patented his water fuel cell design, and no one has reproduced it to work like he said it's supposed to. Some have an explanation for that and speculate that Meyer used his own obscure terminology that he made up to describe his inventions in his patent applications, and he only gave the translations to the patent examiners. Also, remember Meyer wouldn't show Michael Lawton the dune buggy in the second court case. Even though Meyer had already reportedly demonstrated the fuel cell for him, why wouldn't Meyer show Lawton the dune buggy? Some people say that it was worth it for Meyer to not reveal how the technology actually functioned, so people couldn't steal it from him later. But as near as I can tell, that's an unprovable claim. So, maybe. But as many people have looked at this design, you would think that someone would figure out how it worked by now. Also, they say that his twin brother Stephen was with Stanley every step of the way and knew how the technology worked. Why didn't Stephen reproduce it or keep the research going? Possibly because he didn't have the money to keep working on it. In that regard, Philippe said, His brother Steve wanted to continue working and asked if I wanted to finance further. I refused. I felt too much greediness, secrecy, and lack of knowledge and ideal. For me, it was over. Stan was my friend and nobody else. Others say Stephen didn't continue because he didn't want to suffer the same fate as Stanley. Another theory I've seen is that an early design of the fuel cell worked, but Meyer couldn't reproduce it later. 
This one says that Meyer probably got it working during the early 80s using scrap components, including an electrolytic capacitor made out of stainless steel instead of aluminum. They say this could be polarized and might be capable of providing excess energy without breaking the law of conservation of energy. From what I can gather, this theory says that Meyer didn't realize what made it work, and later the car stopped working, but Meyer never figured out why. My technical abilities and understanding are limited with being able to discuss this theory, but if you're interested, I encourage you to look into it and let me know what you find. For what it's worth, Philippe, the Belgian man who people speculate may have been involved in Meyer's demise, said, I am convinced that his project was real, not fake. What happened to the dune buggy after Meyer passed away? Where's the car? According to one source, Stephen Meyer claimed that about a week after Stanley's death, unidentified people stole the dune buggy and his instrument from Stanley's garage, but the vehicle had subsequently been found. The Columbus Dispatch said sometime around 2007, a friend of Meyer's led a reporter to the basement of a property south of Columbus. I really shouldn't be showing you this. When they made it to the garage, there was the dune buggy, with the infamous decal reading, Jesus Christ is Lord. Another source said that in 2014, the vehicle turned up in Canada, under new ownership of the Holbrook family who claimed to be partners and friends of Stanley Meyer. So the buggy might be in Canada now, but we don't really know for sure. And even though Stanley Meyer's water-powered car may be lost to time, his story and his claims certainly are not. The dream of Meyer's water-powered car remains a dream today, but the pursuit of alternative energy sources like hydrogen continues to drive technological innovation. As long as we continue exploring new ways to power humanity, the legacy of Stanley Meyer and his vision for a more sustainable future will endure. Thank you for joining me on this project, and we'll see you on the next one. Until then, watch out for the lizard people.